Morning YouTubers, I got a treat for you guys. I went out and bought a bunch of different 7018 rods that we can test together. And this video is going to be all about 7018 as you can see. There's all sorts of different 7018s. I know that might sound ridiculous because they're all labeled as 7018s, but there are differences. We're going to be talking about that first. Then we're going to actually be doing hands-on welding with them and I'll give you a ton of tips because I know that when I learned how to stick weld with 7018 it was harder than it should have been because I didn't know how to do things like restarts properly with it and it just if you don't know what you're doing it can be a lot harder than like 6013 to work with but it it's really not that bad so let's get into it so in front of us we have all different brands of 7018 now, they're more different than just the brand that made them or what they're packaged as. These all have different specifications. And I know that might sound confusing because they're all, well, 7018s, but not, not all 7018s are equal. All right, all of these rods are realistically spec to run on DCEP, so positive polarity. They do say, at least some of them, that they will work with AC. But I think you're going to find a hard time keeping the arc lit on AC with a lot of them. That's why they make AC specific 7018. So I'd recommend buying that if you have AC only. So let's start out by looking at these. These Lincoln Excalibur rods, if you look here, they are labeled as a 7018MR. That stands for moisture resistant. So either they have a coating or the flux itself is resistant to moisture pickup. When you look at like the SureWeld ESAB rods, which are the cheaper ones, these are their more expensive 7018 Prime. These rods here are not MR labeled and that is because they're not moisture resistant. The purpose of having moisture resistant rods are all 7018s will absorb moisture from the air into the flux and that moisture can create what's known as uh, hydrogen embrittlement. Essentially, your welds can crack. Now, on a structural bridge or a big beam or something, that's a huge concern because obviously the last thing you want is to have a failed weld because really a weld only has one job, to hold two metal pieces together. So if it cracks, that's kind of a huge problem. Well, that's why they developed a 7018 rod that's less likely to pick up moisture, the MR rods. This Lincoln Excalibur is more commonly what you will find uh, in industry or higher liability type work. You will not see generic 7018s that are non-specified on those types of jobs. Now, technically, all of these rods should be kept in a rod oven in order to meet specification. And all a rod oven is, is a heat source that stores these that bakes the water out of them. Bigger jobs are gonna use a big one, like an industrial mini kiln of sorts. And that's, again, to keep the, the moisture out of them. Now, you as a home gamer probably don't have a rod oven, but that doesn't mean that you should just not consider it as something that you probably should get. If you do a lot of welding with older rods that are sitting around, like this box right here might have been around my shop for quite some time and the rods likely have moisture. You're going to want to bake that out of there before you go welding anything critical. For just practice sake, like if you're just burning up some rods on test plates, I wouldn't worry about it. But if you're welding something on an excavator, a dozer, anything with any kind of liability or that you need absolute strength, you want to bake the moisture out of here. I'll put up a little guide to uh, temperatures and times right now so for you to look at. You're probably going to have a hard time reading this on a cell phone, but the gist of it is, is that if you pull non-H4R or MR rated rods out of a container, you must put them immediately in a rod oven at 250 to 300 degrees and bake them, and they have to be stored in there. In the case of the H4R rods, if you buy a brand new can, you can use them directly out of the can up to nine hours without baking them. 
Now this says to rebake rods that have been out for more than a week. It says to pre-bake them at 180 to 220 and then bake them at 650 to 750. If they've been out for less than a week, then 650 to 750 and you bake it until the rods actually hit that temperature. Now there's all sorts of issues at baking at high temperatures with the rod flux disintegrating. So that's something you need to be aware of and watch for. Now, and you saw for the guide, it's, it's somewhat simple. I mean, you could use a little toaster oven. I definitely wouldn't go putting burritos in it after you bake any of these out, but that should give you a better idea of what you need to do. It's not really that big of a deal. Just heat it up to where the moisture, give it enough time for the moisture to escape. You do want to watch the, the peak temperatures. Like you don't want to bake these suckers at 500 degrees. 20 hours. The flux coating can start falling apart. Speaking of issues, I found these rods at the local tractor supply when I was buying different rods for this video. And these are brand new in the package, 7018s. And look at that crack along the flux. You can see it there. Almost every rod in the package was cracked like that. Now you can imagine if you actually tried to use these, how bad of results you would have. Pay attention to what you're buying. But yeah, so anyways, let's get back into it. You understand that hopefully. Now, there's also other designations. If I can bring these up to the camera. So this top rod here, there we go. This top rod is this non-specified ESOB rod. And the bottom one is actually this Hobart rod over here. You can see the nomenclature, they're both 7018. This one says E for electrode, but these have a dash, it looks like. So it's a dash one, that's referring to a specific code that this rod has to meet. The H4R, the H stands for, I believe, diffusible hydrogen. The four means that it has to be tested at under 4%. And the R means resistant, it means moisture resistant. So these Hobart rods that you get at like your local tractor supply or your farm and fleet, those, you know, just off the shelf rods actually meet a moisture resistant out of the box and they meet a higher, more stringent code than these Sure Welds. Now the price difference between these two are pretty close, but if I were you, if you have a box of rods that are going to sit around for a while, I would recommend getting moisture resistant rods. And then when you're done with them, you pull a couple rods out, three, four, tape this shut to keep any moisture from getting into that box. And that will help you a lot in the long run. And again, the top rods, I'll spin them, just has, it's no specification other than 7018. It's worth mentioning and it's kind of a bit ridiculous. These are 7018 rods, and in order to call it a 7018, that means it has to meet the minimum specification from American Welding Society to call it a 7018. And part of that is you actually have to pay the American Welding Society money to be able to call it a 7018. So that's why you get some, like this is US Forge E7018, but I'm gonna go grab uh, a bin of, a tub of uh, 7018s that do not meet that spec. Now these are not 7018s. I do have some that look identical to 7018, but you notice how this says steel 332 AC or DC? I believe these are like a 6013 or 6011. These are unspecified rods. So this very well might be identical to a 6013 or a 6011. However, by not calling that, they're essentially unclassified rods. There are no specifications. This company may on their website have a sheet that tells you tensile strength and all of that, but these are offered at a cheaper rate simply because they're not paying the American Welding Society money to be classified as any particular rod. So you wanna be careful if you really are concerned or doing critical work, you don't wanna be using these. Like if a welding inspector or someone caught you using these things on something critical, that's about the fastest way to unemployment line you could think of. So 
So anyways, back to this. These uh, US Forge, uh, the Vulcan, and these are all, un well, they're classified, but they're not moisture resistant to my knowledge. I, I gotta open these up and look at them. I doubt that they are. So these three are essentially more or less very similar. These ESOB uh, VAC pack ones, these are the 7018 Prime. These I really like because the vacuum pack that they come in is suitable to where you can use these directly out of the package without using a rod oven. So for super critical work, if you're welding on like, I don't know, something that needs absolute strength, buying these, you can just take them right out of the package and completely skip the, the rod oven. I believe you have three or four hours of these out of the package before you have to put them in a rod oven to meet code. So that's something handy. These are also four pound boxes, which is pretty easy to run through in a decent amount of time. So I'm kind of glad that they did it in a smaller package. If it was like a 10 pound pack, you'd never get through that in a time and you'd definitely have to cook them off in a rod oven. Um, these here, again, the, the plastic of this will prevent some moisture pickup. How much? It's hard to say. I believe spec wise, these can be used out of the package. Um, but honestly, with all of them but this, I would say you, you and the Lincoln, because these are, if you look at it, they're sealed. I would say these would be pretty much good to go out of the package. But again, any critical job uh, out in the workplace, odds are they're going to bake it in a rod oven regardless of what the packaging is, just because why risk, you know, something with extreme liability is just not worth it. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention that's kind of interesting, and I'll show you here. These rods by Harbor Freight Vulcan, if you look at the tip of them, see that black uh, dot that's on there? I believe that that is graphite, and that's to help you start the arc with these. 7018s can stick uh, when you try and start the arc fairly frequently when you're not, you know, you're lower experienced. So these will probably help with that. The 7018 Primes by ESUB also function the same way. They have a graphite tip or some sort of a uh, tip on it that aids in the initial strike. Now, obviously, when you weld the rod down, it's no longer there and it won't help you with restarts. But from a starting perspective, it helps. And it also reduces uh, starting porosity, which is a problem with 7018. Well, I think I covered this good enough. Let's actually get into some tips on how to start the arc and some actual welding. All right, when you're learning to weld with 7018, it has a couple distinct, I guess we could call it issues, that some of the other rods don't have. The primary one being is that it's harder to strike an arc with it. So when you take a new fresh rod that has barely any of the electrode hanging out, if I can get that to focus, there, well, somewhat. This is gonna be a little bit easier, but if for any reason, like you stick the rod and then you knock off more of this flux than what's already cleaned off, it's gonna be an absolute bastard to start this, especially if you don't have a hot start feature on your welder. So this is kind of one of those things where if you start the rod and have a really bad start, you definitely want to clean up the area you started with, get all of that crap, the flux, everything off of it. If you have to even grind it, so be it. And then you may have to either file the tip down on the rod or start on a junk piece to get it going and then cut out and clean off the tip in order to restart. And I know that sounds like a lot of hassle to deal with, but once you get good with these, the starts really aren't an issue. It's just at the beginning of learning to weld with this, it's gonna be a little bit harder. Um, the initial starts are hard. The restarts, if you don't know what you're doing, are extremely hard. And I'm gonna show you a trick to deal with that. Actually, a couple tricks that should help you. But once you learn to weld with this, you're really gonna find that 7018, like out of all the rods, I, I would say it's probably the one I use the most because I do a lot of repair, repair work on fairly strong materials like not just dirt cheap material. And this is my go-to. Like uh, I've never had any bad experiences with hydrogen embrittlement myself, but I do either use them fresh out of the pack or I do have a rod oven that I can throw them in. 
So anyways, let's get to actually welding. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strike the arc and I'm gonna run a weld straight across this plate and then we're gonna take a look at it. All right, so I got the machine set for 120 amps and this is quarter inch thick plate. We're gonna start out with the ESOB Shore Weld uh, eighth inch 7018. Look at that, I stuck the rod. Very common, okay? Now I halfway did that on purpose just to show something. Now, if you look here, you see how this flux is split? One of the things that I find when people learn to weld with 7018 and the rod sticks is they really bend it and crank on it. Well, then this whole rod at the end splits up and now your restarts are gonna be absolutely impossible, okay? So what you wanna do is break the stinger off as fast as you can, so pull the stinger off the rod, let this cool, and gently try and twist it, which I really stuck that. Now we're in a pickle. Exactly what I said that's very common to happen, you might have a rod like this. Trying to start this is going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible. And you definitely don't want to start it here because with no flux to produce gas to shield your weld, you're going to get porosity in here. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to, up here on the corner, I'm going to try and start this. I probably will eventually get it. And then we're going to actually look at the restart and see what happens when you do this. All right. And we have porosity as I suspected. Might be a little bit difficult to see there, but there's all sorts of porosity down on that corner if this would just focus. Now, I had a hell of a time. I got the rod to start, and then the arc, despite me having a drag angle, the arc was shooting back this way, and it just, until I burned off that metal rod that was exposed and got to the flux, it just, this whole area did not weld at all, like it just terribly. So once it got settled in, a little bit better there. So what you want to do with that, there's a couple things you can do. Now your welding instructor, or you shouldn't be happy with it either, when you have the rod screwed up like that on the end, obviously you don't want to weld on your practice piece. You have a couple options. One, you could take a scrap piece, do what I did on here, burn the rod off enough to where it's starting to run good and then snap out of it fast. That way you got to where like what this is, where this is what you wanna see, okay? You have that option. You could take, cut the end of the rod and file it a little bit, maybe with a grinder. Again, that's kind of time consuming most people I know will just restart, you know, on, on a piece of scrap. Now, you don't really want to throw this rod away for practice purposes, but maybe if you're welding on something so critical that it's not even worth that much risk, maybe you would just set this aside and not use it or throw it out. But again, we're not building nuclear reactors here, I don't think. So um, do like I said, find a piece of scrap restart. Which brings up my next point. So the restarts on these can be really bad, especially when the flux is broken off. However, this is not broken off. Um, it is in good shape. However, I'm gonna just see, it may restart easily, but I'm gonna try. 
You see how this doesn't want to start? The reason is, is that the flux is sticking so far out from the core. So what you want to do is just take your thumbs, pinch the tip. Now you want to be careful because this sucker could be hot. Now look at it. It looks very much like a new electrode. Now it should start a lot easier than what it did previously where it didn't want to start. You can also take and tap this on the plate. I, you'll see me do that in some of my videos. That's to knock the ball of silicon off the end. Now, when you're done welding with the rod, and I, you may have seen me do it, maybe I didn't, I, I, it's kind of a force of habit, I will flick the rod at the end. And the purpose of doing that is so that the molten ball of silicon and metal that sticks on the end of the tip will fly off of this. You wanna be careful, because if you, it's like a mini burning sun and it'll set stuff on fire, so you wanna be mindful. But when you do that, it keeps the rod tip cleaner. Like you see how it's recessed in there? I'll run a pass, uh, like a one inch weld. Actually, I'll do it on my welding table and I'm not gonna do that and then we'll take a look. So you wanna compare that. Now take a look, it's a little hot there, but you see all of that crap that's on the end there? Trying to restart this, it can't conduct electricity through that stuff. And I'll let this cool a little bit and show you. I'll actually, I'll let this sit here and we'll clean up this weld and take a look at that first. Now 7018, if you run uh, decent, the slag will pretty much clean itself. Now, I didn't get slag peel on this, but you can see, I mean, that's pretty much it. That's one of the many reasons why I and so many welders really like 7018, is that it makes real nice beads that are very easy to clean the slag off of, okay? Very easy to run. So with this big ball of silicon and metal. Let's see how easy this will restart. I mean, I can tap it and it just, it just barely starts. If you get a big enough ball on there, even just tapping it won't work. So back when I was learning to weld with 7018, I actually kept a little file in my pocket and I would just file the end of the rod on it a few times and that would be enough to get a good start. But I honestly found the best method is what I described earlier, where when I hit near the end, I just flick the rod to, to throw that ball of molten material off, let the rod cool, and then I just pinch the tip with my finger a little bit. And see this again is, it's a ball on the end, like pinching this doesn't really do anything. But if you can get that ball off of there and just pinch the side of the flux, crimp it a little bit, it'll restart just like a new rod does. So I find that be, is the best solution. So let me run the rest of this rod out and I will flick it, the ball at the end. Another tip I didn't even mention, I'm a big fan of when I chuck a rod into this, and you probably didn't see me do it, I generally spin it. And you see on that rod where it wore that coating off of the core there? 
With 7018, I find that when you spin it, it makes better contact, and for whatever reason, the starts seem to be a little bit easier versus just chucking it in the jaws. Now we will get some arc footage here pretty soon. We're just dealing with the basics right now. And we're nearing the end, so I will flick the ball off of it. And there you go. The ball wound up here and some over there. But now take a look at that rod. See how there's no ball on there? Now once you let it cool and you just crimp that, or you don't wait and you burn your gloves. See, rods exposed, nice and clean, easy restart. Trust me, do it, you'll like it. Again, to clean this, generally all you have to do is tap the toe of it and it all comes off. Very easy, very smooth. This rod is so much easier to me in, in just all positions to run in 6013 and 6010 for that matter. And clean that tip off. There we go. Now, let's take a look here. I don't see any evidence of starting porosity. It's very common on 7018 when you start to get porosity right at the start. And that's because the rod, the tip hasn't warmed up enough, the shielding gas hasn't been created, and the molten metal gets exposed to oxygen. So one of the ways you can avoid that is that when you start, rather than starting on the end like I did, you start maybe a quarter inch in, you strike the arc, and then you just carry the arc over to the edge and then weld through. So... You start here, carry, weld through. I find that like ESOB 7018 Prime with the graphite tip, I almost, I, I can't remember one time I've ever seen running that starting porosity. And I think the reason is, is that that graphite on a tip creates essentially a long arc and it gets that rod good and hot before it actually deposits any metal and therefore, if there's no metal being deposited, then there's no risk of porosity due to oxygen contamination or reaction of the molten pooled with the air. So I've, I've never seen starting porosity with that rod under my use, which is why, honestly, uh, since I started using it, I really like that stuff. And that would be my recommendation for you home gamers. But I'll, I'll talk more about that at the end. But yeah, so this two rods of... Uh, the Hobart, I believe it was. No, actually, so that was Aesop Sherweld. They look good, no porosity start. Uh, starting it is pretty easy. So let's switch over, and I'm just gonna run two passes with this uh, H4R. This is the Hobart brand rod. I'm gonna run two passes, and then we're gonna start looking at some arc footage so I can teach you guys what you should be seeing. Come on, buddy. This guy will probably have starting porosity. Hmm. Better stop and take the time to clean this. I had a rough start and it just kind of is meandering around. I'm going to try and tap it a few times. There we go. Again, threw the ball off at the end, 
rod is clear, I'll give that enough time to cool, knock the corners off. It's all ready to be welded again. I'll let that plate cool a little bit. From my aspect, it almost seemed like that was depositing a bigger weld. And just by looking at it, they seem pretty similar. My start was a lot rougher with that, but that's probably just me. And the plate's kind of hot anyways. Yeah, I think just the heat in the plate is why it wetted out a little bit more. It's a little bit flatter. Let me go quench this and then we'll start again. Again, I had a little bit of a rough start with that. Not really too worried about that. I do not see any porosity. I did start, tried to start off the edge, was like, you know, it's a better idea. I started here, brought it back, and then welded through. So pretty decent looking bead. A little bit of slag peel there, or in the slag. Right there, let's get that, well, still on there. So yeah, beads look pretty similar overall. Not a huge difference. So I will quench this and then I'm gonna get set up and we'll take some arc shots. All right, I'm gonna let this play and then I'll replay it and comment. All right, this is the same video. I struck the arc a little bit ahead and then brought it back to the edge. The molten puddle is the liquidy part that you see me slowly dragging along. The video footage later is going to be better. This is a new clip. I'll comment on it when I repeat it. So this is the same clip, there aren't two rods, it's just a reflection. I struck the arc a little bit ahead of where I wanted to start and brought it back to the start and welded through it. You can see the puddle somewhat defined there, and I'm just laying the metal down. It's kind of like melting a crayon off on a hot skillet is the best way I could describe it. Here's a new clip, we'll watch it and then I'll comment. So this is the same clip we just watched. Now I want you to pay attention to the molten pool. You see how clearly defined that eye is? One of the great things with 7018 is how easy it is to see the puddle. It's not like 6013, which can be very difficult to read. And I'm just dragging that molten puddle along nice and slow. Here's a new video. I'll comment on the repeat of it. All right, here's a repeat. Now, 
That molten eye shape, you see how it comes to a smaller point that's a little bit rounded off? If you drag the rod too fast, if your travel speed's too high, you won't get that eye shape. It'll start shaping itself like a peanut or won't look that distinguished. That's a very good example of either running too low of amperage or moving too fast. The whole goal is just to get that eye shape to start and then slowly drag it along to where it stays the same shape and it doesn't get longer or shorter. All right, so I ran a bunch of test welds, two welds with each rod, and then I also ran a couple other welds on scrap metal just to get better arc shots. And I just want to take a look at what we found here. Well, I would say that they all run pretty much equal. I mean, just from bead appearance. So if I can get that to balance there. Ran the Sure Weld first, then the Hobart 7018. This is the ESOB 7018 Prime. This is the um, Harbor Freight. This is the US Forge. And then this is the Lincoln. The Lincoln might look a little bit rougher, but for the most part, I let this stuff uh, cool down. But this one, I ran this pass, and then this one near the edge ran it again. So it, it was getting a little hot, you could say. The whole plate was glowing red. But yeah, I mean, from a, my perspective under the welding lens, I would say that they all ran very similar. I found that the Hobart actually was harder to start than any of the other ones overall. And I even used the Hobart to do the test welds uh, off this plate and it seemed to be harder to start. Not really a huge deal. I mean, if you follow what I said earlier in the video about fixing it, you know, so you actually can get a decent start, it's not really a big deal, but it definitely seemed to be harder to start. Um, the only other thing really to note is that Harbor Freight and the ESOB Prime definitely have like a carbon tip or a graphite tip, and both of those are way easier to start than the other ones. I mean, you just even get it close to the plate and the thing starts itself. So if you're having issues with porosity on the starts of your uh, whatever you're welding or you're just having an overall hard time starting, those two rods actually seem to start, you know, better than average. And that's due to the graphite tip. And I'm kind of surprised Harbor Freight would put that on their rod. Not something that I would have thought that they would have thought about doing, but they did. Now, I'll just show you the stubs here. The ESOB, as you saw earlier, just says 7018. The Hobart says 7018-1H4R. And I actually learned something shooting this video. I looked up the dash one. That has to do with what's called a Sharpie V-notch test, where apparently the dash one means that they tested the Sharpie test on this at negative 50 degrees versus I think negative 20, which at low temperatures, the dash one will actually um, be better overall. So at super low temperatures, that would be the way to go. Again, that's all like for code work. If you're just building stuff on your tractor, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And then uh, here is the ESOB 71, 7018-1 Prime. And this is also a dash one. And this has the graphite tip on it. Take a look at this. This is your Harbor Freight, which just says American Welding Society 7018. Nothing special, no extra code compliance there. This is kind of funny. Just 7018, that's it. Now, this is the U.S. Forge. It's worth noting that burning this stuff, it kind of had an odd smell of, I don't want to say perfume, but it definitely didn't smell like the other ones. And I'll be honest, I probably should be wearing a respirator. I mean, my air handling unit in here is taking care of the, the smoke, but the fact that it kind of had a floral scent to it, a little interesting, wasn't expecting that. 
and then uh, the Excalibur 7018. Now this is not a dash one according to what uh, the rod is labeled, but it is H4R. It's also worth noting, if you look at how far this rod is off of the flux, when you grab and put that in your stinger, you gotta be real careful because look how much will easily stick out the back. Even if you grab it halfway and you set this sucker down, boom, you're gonna arc flash yourself. I didn't, but um, that is uh, pretty crazy there. So be careful with that one. Or you'll weld your table. So either way, you kind of don't wanna do that. So yeah, uh, I would say if I was gonna use any of these rods, and I, I do a fair amount of 7018 work, honestly, I just stick with the ESOB 7018 Prime. I get mine from Northern Tool or the local welding supply store, or I generally use Lincoln Excaliburs, and the Excalibur rod was what I used in welding school. I must have burned up 200 pounds of that stuff. So it's what I'm used to, works good. But hey, in a pinch, use any of the other ones. Just keep in mind if you're doing something critical, you definitely want to bake them out in a rod oven because most of them, the packaging will not keep moisture off. Like this US Forge is just paper, a little plastic. So yeah, uh, there you have it. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, you know where to leave them. Anyways, thanks guys. Till next time.